This video provides an overview of the major concepts covered in Chapter 8, Bond Valuation and Risk. The values of bonds can change substantially over time. Hence, financial institutions that consider buying or selling bonds closely monitor their values. Chapter 8 is comprised of five key learning objectives. First, to explain how bonds are priced. Second, to identify the factors that affect bond prices. Third, to explain how the sensitivity of bond prices to interest rates depends on particular bond characteristics. Fourth, to describe common strategies used to invest in bonds. And fifth, to explain the valuation and risk of international bonds. Let's begin with discussing the bond valuation process. The appropriate price of a bond reflects the present value of the cash flows to be generated by the bond in the form of periodic interest or coupon payments and the principal payment to be provided at maturity, all discounted at the required rate of return or yield to maturity. The coupon payment is based on the coupon rate multiplied by the par value of the bond. The current price of a bond can be calculated manually using this formula, but fortunately, most of us now have access to an affordable financial calculator or app that allows us to calculate the bond price much more efficiently. Consider a bond that has a par value of $1,000, pays $100 at the end of each year in coupon payments, and has three years remaining until maturity. Also assume that the prevailing annualized yields on other bonds with similar characteristics is 12%. The future cash flows to the investor who would purchase the bonds are $100 in year one, $100 in year two, and $1,100 in year three computed as the $100 coupon payment plus the $1,000 par value. Here's what the application of the manual formula would look like to calculate the price of the bonds, but when using a financial calculator, we would simply enter 3 as the number of periods N, 12 as the yield to maturity, I, 100 as the coupon payment, PMT, and 1,000 as the face value of the bond, FV. Both the formula and the calculator will yield a present value of $951.97. The discount rate selected to compute the present value is critical in accurately valuing bonds. This graph shows the wide range of present values that would result from using different discount rates for a $10,000 payment in 10 years. The appropriate discount rate for valuing assets is any yield that could be earned on alternative investments with similar risk and maturity. Because investors require higher returns on riskier securities, they use higher discount rates to discount the future cash flows of these securities. Consequently, a high-risk security will have a lower value than a low-risk security with the same expected cash flows. The market price of a bond is also affected by the timing of the payments made to bondholders. The impact of maturity on the present value of a $10,000 payment is shown in this graph, assuming that a 10% return could be earned on available funds. Now, in reality, most bonds have semi-annual payments. The present value of such bonds can be calculated by cutting the annualized coupon in half because two payments are made per year, dividing the annual discount rate in half to reflect two six-month periods per year, and doubling the number of periods to reflect the semi-annual payments. With these adjustments made to our original example, with the bond now being semi-annual, the present value of the bond is $950.82. Note now that N is 6, I is 6, and the coupon payment PMT is 50. Bonds that sell at a price below their par value are called discount bonds. The larger the investor's required rate of return relative to the coupon rate, the larger the discount of a bond with a particular par value will be. Consider a zero coupon bond, one that has no coupon payments with three years remaining to maturity, a $1,000 par value, and a required rate of 13%. The present value of the bond would be $693.05, which is simply the present value of the $1,000 face value to be received at the end of year 3. The very low price of this bond is necessary to generate a 13% annualized return to investors. Now assume the bond has a 13% coupon rate resulting in an annual coupon of $130. The present value now would be $1,000. Notice that the price of this bond is exactly equal to its par value as the coupon payments provide the entire compensation required by investors. Finally, assume now that the bond pays a 15% coupon or $150 per year. The present value now would be $1,047.22, which is greater than the $1,000 par value of the bond and therefore sells at a premium. The price of this bond exceeds its par value because the coupon payments are large enough to offset the price paid for the bond and still provide a 13% annualized return.
This exhibit shows the relationship between required return and present value for a 10% coupon bond with various maturities. Regardless of the maturity period of the bond, when the required rate and coupon rate are the same, in this case 10%, a $1,000 bond will sell at its par value, or $1,000. As the rate of return increases, the bond will sell at a discount, or less than its face value, and at any return less than the coupon rate, the bond will sell at a premium, or for more than its face value. Now let's look at explaining bond price movements. As we saw, the price of a bond should reflect the present value of future cash flows based on a required rate of return, K. So we can conclude then that the change in the bond price, PB, is a function of the change of the required rate of return, K. Because the required rate of return on a bond is determined by the prevailing risk-free rate, RF, which is the yield on the treasury bond with the same maturity, and a credit risk premium RP on the bond, it follows that the general price movements of bonds can be modeled as the change in bond price, PB, is a function of changes in either the risk-free rate or the risk premium. The long-term risk-free rate, RF, is a bit of a moving target and can be expressed in this relationship where RF is impacted by inflationary expectations, INF, economic growth, ECOM, the money supply, MS, and the budget deficit, DEF. The general level of credit risk on corporate or municipal bonds can change in response to a change in economic growth, econ. So we can observe that the change in the risk premium, RP, is a function of economic growth. The credit risk premium also tends to be larger for bonds that have longer terms to maturity. The bond's price can also be affected by factors specific to the issuer of the bond, such as a change in its capital structure. If a firm that issues bonds subsequently obtains additional loans, it may be less capable of making its coupon payments, so its credit risk increases. Consequently, investors would now require a higher rate of return if they were to purchase those bonds in the secondary market, which would cause the market value, or the price of the bonds, to decrease. In summary then, when considering the factors that affect the risk-free rate and the risk premium, the general price movements in bonds can be modeled as follows. The relationships suggested here assume that other forces are held constant. This exhibit summarizes that the underlying forces that can affect the long-term risk-free interest rate and the credit risk premium, thereby causing the general level of bond prices to change over time. Many financial institutions, such as insurance companies, pension funds, and bond mutual funds maintain large holdings of bonds. The values of their portfolios are susceptible to changes in the various factors already described that affect bond prices. Financial institutions that participate in bond markets could be exposed to systemic risk, meaning the potential collapse of the entire market or financial system. The next key concept in the chapter relates to sensitivity of bond prices to interest rate movements. Two common methods for assessing the sensitivity of bonds to a change in the required rate of return on bonds are bond price elasticity and duration. The sensitivity of bond prices, PB, to changes in the required rate of return K is commonly measured by the bond price elasticity, or PBE, which is estimated as the percentage change in the bond price PB divided by the percentage change in the required rate of return K. This exhibit compares the price sensitivity of 10-year bonds with a $1,000 par value and four different coupon rates, 0, 5, 10, and 15%. Focusing on the top half of the table, which looks at the effects of decreasing the required rate of return, a $1,000 bond with a 5% coupon and 10% yield to maturity will sell for $693. When the yield drops to 8%, or a change of minus 20%, the bond will sell for $799, which is a 15.3% increase. Thus, the bond price elasticity is 15.3 divided by negative 20, or negative 0.765. The bottom half of the table considers the effects of increasing the rate of return. The same 5% coupon bond selling for $693 at a yield to maturity of 10% will sell for $605 or 12.7% lower when the yield increases to 12%. That's a plus 20% change. The bond elasticity now is negative 12.7 divided by 20 or negative 0.635. A zero-coupon bond, which pays all of its proceeds to the investor at maturity, is most sensitive to changes in the required rate of return because the adjusted discount rate is applied to one lump sum in the distant future. 
Finally, as interest rates and therefore the required rate of return decrease, long-term bond prices, as measured by their present value, increase by a greater degree than short-term bond prices because the long-term bonds will continue to offer the same coupon rate over a longer period of time than the short-term bonds. An alternative measure of bond price sensitivity is the bond's duration, which is a measurement of the life of the bond on a present value basis. The longer a bond's duration, the greater its sensitivity to interest rate changes. A commonly used measure of a bond's duration, DUR, is this nasty looking formula. The numerator of the duration formula represents the present value of future payments weighted by the time interval until the payments occur. The longer the intervals until payments are made, the larger the numerator and the duration are. The denominator of the duration formula represents the discounted future cash flows resulting from the bond, which is the present value of the bond. This duration measure is also called the Macaulay duration. Using this formula, the duration of a bond with a $1,000 par value and a 7% coupon rate, three years remaining to maturity, and a 9% yield to maturity is calculated to be 2.8 years. By comparison, the duration of a zero coupon bond with a similar par value and yield to maturity is three years. Bond portfolio managers commonly attempt to immunize their portfolios by taking steps intended to insulate its values from the effects of interest rate movements. The first step in the process is to determine the sensitivity of their portfolio to such movements. Once the duration of each individual bond is measured, the bond's portfolio duration, DURP, can be determined. In other words, the duration of a bond portfolio is the weighted average of bond durations, with the weights based on the bond's relative market value. The modified duration, denoted as DUR star, is estimated as DUR divided by 1 plus K, where K is the prevailing yield rate on bonds. The modified duration can be used to estimate the percentage change in the bond's price in response to a 1 percentage point in the prevailing bond yields. For example, assume that bond X has a duration of 8 years and bond Y a duration of 12 years. Assuming that the prevailing bond yield is 10%, the modified duration for bond X would be 7.27 years and 10.9 years for bond Y. According to the modified duration estimates, a 1 percentage point increase in bond yields from 10 to 11% would lead to a 7.27% decline in the price of bond X and a 10.9% decline in the price of bond Y. The percentage change in the bond's price in response to a change in yield can be expressed more directly with a simple equation where the percentage change in the bond price, PB, is equal to the inverse of the modified duration DUR star multiplied by the percentage change in yield, Y. For example, the percentage change in the price for bond X for an increase in yield of 0.2 percentage points would be negative 1.45%. If investors rely strictly on modified duration to estimate the percentage change in the price of a bond, they will tend to overestimate the price decline associated with an increase in rates and underestimate the price associated with a decrease in rates. A more complete formula to estimate the percentage change in price in response to a change in yield will incorporate the property of convexity as well as modified duration and is shown in this exhibit where for a given one percentage point change in bond yields from our initially assumed bond yield of 10%, the modified duration predicts a specific change in bond price. However, the actual response of a bond's price to a change in bond yields is convex as indicated by the shape of the red curve in the graph. Notice that if the bond yield on the horizontal axis changes slightly from the initial level of 10%, the difference between the expected bond price adjustment according to the modified duration estimate, the straight line, and the bond's actual price adjustment, the convex curve, is small. For relatively large changes in the bond yield, however, the bond price adjustment as estimated by modified duration is less accurate. The larger the change in the bond yield, the larger the error from estimating the change in bond price in response to the change in yield. The fourth key concept in the chapter relates to bond investment strategies. Many investors value bonds and assess their risk when managing investments. Some investors, such as bond portfolio managers of financial institutions, follow a specific strategy for investing in bonds. There are four main strategies including a matching strategy where some investors create a bond portfolio that will generate periodic income to match their expected periodic expenses. 
Next is a laddered strategy where funds are evenly allocated to bonds in each of the several different maturity classes. Third is a barbell strategy where funds are allocated to bonds with a short-term maturity as well as to bonds with a long-term maturity. And last is the interest rate strategy where funds are allocated in a manner that capitalizes on interest rate forecasts. The last concept in the chapter relates to valuation and risk of international bonds. Bond values can be influenced by foreign interest rate movements. As the risk-free interest rate of a currency changes, the rate of return required by investors in that country will change as well. In turn, the present value of a bond denominated in that currency changes. Bond prices can also be influenced by credit risk. An increase in credit or default risk causes a higher required rate of return for the bond and lowers its present value, whereas a reduction in risk causes a lower required rate of return on the bond and increases its present value. Another factor influencing bond valuations is fluctuating exchange rates. For example, changes in the value of the foreign currency denominating a bond affect the U.S. dollar cash flows generated from the bond, thereby influencing the return to U.S. investors who invest in it. This exhibit shows how the dollar cash flows generated from an investment will differ under three different scenarios of a weak, stable, or strong British pound. Finally, bond values are also affected by international bond diversification. When investors attempt to capitalize on investments in foreign bonds that have higher interest rates than they can obtain locally, they may diversify their foreign bond holdings among countries to reduce their exposure to interest rate risk, credit risk, and exchange rate risk, as well as international integration of credit risk.